On the southern tip of New Jersey is a highly unusual site, an imposing, abandoned military bunker that has been forgotten by most for almost 80 years. This structure is the essence of a turbulent past, recalling a time when something as universally beautiful as an Atlantic beach could be perceived as a national vulnerability. Yet, in our current world, the idea of a coastal invasion of the United States is almost laughable to most. Considering its enormous size, position between two oceans, and its role among the strongest nations in history, it's truly difficult to imagine an operation such as D-Day occurring on the coast of America with any degree of success. However, that was not always the administration's or the people's point of view. In fact, right up until World War II, there was a tangible fear that America's enemies would attack by sea and that we were woefully underprepared. Such is the background of Battery 223, a harbor defense battery on the beach of Cape May, New Jersey. Built in 1942 and 1943 and operating for less than two years, until ultimately it was abandoned in 1944. So with that in mind, why was this New Jersey bunker just abandoned? And why does it matter? Stay tuned to find out as today we discover Cape May's forgotten bunker. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. And kind of a side note, but I wanted to point out that this beautiful footage of the New Jersey coast was provided by our sponsor, Storyblocks. Storyblocks offers unlimited downloads of diverse and high quality media for one predictable subscription cost. So say goodbye to expensive pay-per-clip pricing. It's also pretty flexible. You can choose a monthly or annual plan with no hidden or extra fees ever. In fact, anyone watching who might like to start their own history channel, I'd highly recommend using their library. This is the best motion library on the market. It keeps you legally covered with clear-cut licensing, and it's easy to use from search to editing to publishing. You'll also save hours with pre-made motion graphic templates like After Effects, Premiere Pro, DaVinci Resolve, or Apple Motion. To get started with unlimited stock media downloads at one set price, head to storyblocks.com slash its history or click the link in the description. Thank you Storyblocks for sponsoring our channel. And now back to the lost bunkers of New Jersey. For a deeper understanding of this story, let's go way back, starting with the first fortifications along the Atlantic coast. These actually existed before the United States did as a country. You see, as the pre-independence 13 colonies were responsible for their defenses, they were mainly low-budget earthworks for defense against pirate raids and the like. However, by the time the American Revolution came to an end in 1783, what remained of these defenses were not suitable. After war scares in 1794 and 1807, the Young Republic authorized Congress to create two systems of defense. These first two systems, mainly made of earth with some masonry backing intended to be outfitted with smooth bore cannons, were not built with any kind of uniformity or durability. Very few of these were completed as after the threat of war faded, the projects were abandoned and eventually deteriorated, wiping away the vast majority of the first and second systems without a trace. Notable exceptions include the star-shaped fortresses built during this period, including Fort McHenry in Baltimore and Fort Wood, which is now the base of the Statue of Liberty. However, the War of 1812 changed all of this. After a continental war where America achieved very few of its aims, only being considered a draw after the Battle of New Orleans, the need for a coastal defense was now very tangible. So in 1816, Congress gathered over $800,000 for a new fortification program, the Third System, which also happened to be the biggest American fortification construction program to date. These fortifications, built during peacetime, were designed to be permanent. So President James Madison appointed a board of engineers for fortifications, who visited potential sites and planned the new works. The initial report suggested 50 sites, but by 1850, the board had recommended nearly 200. The final report suggested 200 fortifications along the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico, joined by another 20 fortifications on the West Coast, but only a quarter of these proposed works were ever built. Still, these buildings immediately became central to the coastal defense of America. 
These fortifications were constructed throughout the early 1800s, right up to the outbreak of the American Civil War. During the Civil War, fortifications were needed on very short notice. The new constructions of this period were primarily wood-revetted earthworks, sometimes built right near a third system fort to supplement the firepower, and other times stood alone. That being said, most of the time, they closed passageways to deny the enemy access to important transit networks. As they were wartime fortifications, they were of course designed to be temporary, but one permanent addition to the defense plan was the introduction of underwater mines and seacoast defenses. After the Civil War, defenses began to suffer from budget cuts, and part of what made the American Civil War such a bloody affair was the use of outdated tactics despite advancements in technology. And the budget cuts certainly didn't help the situation. Anyhow, one of the advancements that became prevalent post-Civil War was the rifled cannons. These rifled cannons, as well as high-caliber cannons, that is, cannons that shoot larger rounds, made the masonry defense much less effective. To combat this, several new works began using masonry revetted earth fortifications through the 1870s, though most of them were abandoned by the early 1880s. As time wore on, advancements in artillery made coastal defenses seem increasingly obsolete. These advancements freed up the Navy to take a much more offensive role, in a way leaving slack for the seacoast defenses to take up. With some moderate modifications during and after the Spanish-American War, including more searchlights, electrification for lighting, communications and projectile handling, as well as a more sophisticated optical aiming technique, these defense systems were brought up to the international average by the time the First World War came about. However, the First World War was a distant conflict for the United States, so making use of those coastal defenses seemed much less plausible. As a result, the coastal artillery units were removed from the seacoast defenses and moved overseas where they would be of much more use. On the home front, the defenses instead became headquarters for enlistment and training. After the war, the United States Army scaled back dramatically, and the coastal defenses were used for training camps and for reserves. And hence, very few new batteries were built during this time, and improvements were few and far between, with the biggest being gun upgrades and the addition of anti-aircraft units. And now that we have the context, we arrive at the period of the Cape May Defense Battery. You might be wondering why we took so much time addressing the past of coastal defense batteries, and this is why. The bunker in Cape May came in at the tail end of a long battle against obsolescence. As the 1930s ran on, defenses on the Pacific coast became prioritized over the Atlantic due to the aggression from Imperial Japan, but after the war broke out in Europe in 1939, the focus somewhat shifted back to the East Coast. These defense projects were handled by a harbor defense board established in 1931, but the resources available to them were generally quite low. Though an attack from the ocean seemed somewhat unlikely, the obsolescence of the coastal defense became an enormous issue when France fell in 1940. After that, the War Department put together an elaborate modernization program headed by the Harbor Defense Board, which was approved after careful consideration by the General Staff and approved from Congress. It was this modernization program that led to the creation of Battery 223 in Cape May. It was positioned here to support Fort Miles in Delaware as a part of a three-battery support network and was armed with two six-inch guns each having a nine-mile range. It was one of the 200 bunkers built for the modernization plan, and while the plan was meant to cover both coasts of the United States, Hawaii, the Caribbean, the Panama Canal Zone, and many more areas, it was only two-thirds to completion before the war ended. Well, the system as a whole wasn't completed. The Fort Miles Defense Network involved a lot of firepower. It was originally thought that four 155mm, two 8-inch and two 14-inch guns would fully cover Cape May, but the modernization plan changed that. Authorization was received on July the 27th, 1942 for the creation of batteries 118, 221, 222, 
223, and 519, beginning construction in the fall of 1942 and completed in June of 1943, the building is made of thick, reinforced concrete caped with a blast-proof roof. The structure is roughly T-shaped, with a long rectangle running east to west, parallel with the shoreline, and a central block extending south. It was originally completely buried for better camouflage and protection, but in the years since, it has been fully exposed, with the wood piling supporting it rising out of the beach it currently sits on. It wasn't always on the sand of the beach either. Back during its construction, it was 900 feet away from the shore, but severe erosion put its pilings underwater as early as the 1970s. I'd also point out that this story isn't entirely unique to New Jersey. In fact, wherever you have coastlines and civilization that needs to be protected, you'll more than likely have the remainders of old military bunkers. All it takes is a bit of beach erosion for their past to be uncovered. Once it is, those ruins oftentimes lead much further to networks of tunnels, forgotten places that we love so much here on its history. Due to several factors, including needing a road and requiring more support for its structure, it went over budget during its construction. The other battery's budgets of $241,170 were not enough, and Battery 223 requested additional funds in June of 1943 receiving an additional $101,838 the next month. The construction of facilities to serve the battery went ahead. By the time these facilities were completed, however, the situation had changed. As the war turned in favor of the Allied powers, it was becoming increasingly apparent that the static defenses obsolescence had become too much to bear. Ever since airplanes became a common sight on the battlefield, bunkers and batteries made very easy targets. And no matter how much armor was packed on, more bombs could be dropped until they eventually cracked. And even if that was not the case, the United States was fighting a war far from New Jersey. The battles were waged in Europe and across the Pacific, half a world away from Cape May. So with every victory, the likelihood of the guns ever firing for anything but training became more and more distant. And with every step away from that likelihood, the military made more cuts. Battery 223 was among the first to go, decommissioned in 1944 before the war even ended. By 1950, the coastal artillery branch that had operated the guns was merged with the field artillery branch to form a single branch for the army. Fort Miles itself wouldn't last much longer, as that too was closed in 1958. The changing times had caught up to the static defenses, and Battery 223 came right in at the end. However, it remains. Instead of retiring to a beach like so many of us want to, the beach came to it, unearthing it and showing it off like never before. And time has not been kind, as the concrete has been devastated and is even outright missing in areas. The original entrance is missing its doors and is just boarded up. Very few light fixtures remain, and the generators in the power room are long gone. Despite this, Battery 223 is in good condition given its circumstances of being abandoned for 80 years. As of June the 25th, 2008, it is a member of the United States National Register of Historic Places, immortalizing it in American history. Coming into existence right at the end of viability of static defenses, the Cape May Battery still stands defiantly. Never having seen combat or strife, it nevertheless guarded the shores of its home state for as long as it needed to. Well, it languished in its abandonment and has now been immortalized on the National Register of Historic Places as a reminder of the home front defense effort of World War II. Well, it came in at the very last moment that it could. It lived on far longer than many static defenses of its age. And while it never got to serve its born purpose, it did find a new purpose as a historic site. And perhaps finding a new reason to exist is better than outright demolition. And with that, I thank you all for watching, and until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.